Hello all, my name is Urta Wanderer, and I've come out of the jungle today in order to talk with one of our greatest w generals, the Great Lizard Wizard. How are we doing today, Wizard? I'm doing very well, thank you. How have you been? So far, things are going well. Dis despite the fact that my armies have not hit the table in a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I'm jonesing for some proper Sigmar. Uh, Boise Open Cup, which was the tournament still on schedule uh that i had had a ticket for uh most recent one that is like most uh closest to they just canceled boise open oh so that was sad yeah understandable but i was pr planning on hitting my first tournaments this year but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen you know at the same time though i gotta admit there's nothing like instant stress relief equal to canceled plans like the second boise cup was canceled i was like oh cool i can take my time painting up my croak uh mm. so yeah silver linings silver linings all righty we have a few questions to address from our avid audience let's see uh this one is a more complicated one but some i keep getting are skinks or sores better in our army mm. Hmm. I like skinks more. Um, in in general, uh, I lean towards handvils, hammers more than anvils, mm -hmm. um, because anvils are a bit more passive in how you play them. Right. Uh, hammers you have a lot more control over, uh, and skinks are definitely more hammer, and I feel like sars are a bit more anvil. Um, Not much of one, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially if you're like going the standard like Saurus centric Cultul's Claw type build, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely uh, relying a lot on a bit of attrition. Like you've still got punch, but you're, it's very you're really much a want to be able to take one. Yeah, um, it's sort of a mid range between the two. Uh, they... Whereas Skinks are very much like Glass Hammer. Mm -hmm. A lot of things in our army are Glass Hammer, mm -hmm. but I, I'd have to agree in general, Skinks fill more jobs better than Saurus do. I, I actually kind of disagree with you on whether they make better hammers, because I think that Saurus have a much higher damage ceiling than Skinks do. That's true, yeah. Especially once you start getting some of the uh, Saurus hero command abilities. Mm -hmm. They do take three buffs as opposed to two, though, so mm -hmm. ultimately Skinks are easier to wield, uh, wield so lower skill floor uh and in, in some respect um saurus are also a bit more beginner friendly because if you just have saurus and you're doing nothing with them other than them being saurus uh they will perform better than if you just have skinks and you do nothing with them Very like much if so. you just have 40 skinks and that's what you're going to use uh you'll do way better with um 20 saurus uh So, answer overall, it depends. Skinks are better generally in a skilled player's hands. Sources do their job very, very well, regardless. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Alrighty. Have you been doing anything hobby related? Uh, well, sort of. So, I. This was really sad. I dropped a box of hobby projects that I was working on while leaving a friend's house oh, no. down his outside stairs. Uh, oh, no. So, yeah, yeah, it was bad. Like, bolas went everywhere. It, yeah, it was, it was bad. Uh, so I've been repairing, uh, and that sort of sapped my will to hobby, so I haven't gotten back around to it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all I've done for hobby uh, within the past week. Fair enough. I... I have plans, but the stores are closed, so, oh well. Mm, yeah, that's fair. We'll get into that when they actually starts happening. Yeah, yeah. Alrighty then. We're going to be continuing today our general topic from last week, but in more depth of how list building works, and generally branch off from there. So, oh, yeah. you're our resident expert on this. Where are we going? So for this section of the conversation, um, 
the overall concept that I would want to convey, uh, like what I would say the theme of this one will be, uh, is list building with goals. Um, list building to a specific end to accomplish a specific thing with your list and understanding what those are and how that goes about building a winning list. Okay. Um, and there can be like this, this specifically focused towards uh, tournament list building. Um, if you want to build, there's any other number of ways to build themed lists and all sorts of other things. Um, but these talking points specifically for building a tournament viable list. Uh, right. Many things yeah. work, but tournament you have to key things much more delicately. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so the the first thing that goes into building uh, a tournament quality list is knowing the paths to victory. Uh, and what I mean by this is understanding what actions your list has to accomplish in order for it to win. Specifically, it comes down to objectives. Um, the majority of objectives and battle plans will be won by consistently having more bodies on more objectives than your opponent or by getting to what objectives are there first and continuing to hold them. Um, right. It's one of the early mistakes that new players make. Despite the fact that you're taking an army to a battle, the game is not about killing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Killing uh, is useful. Very much so. But that should uh -huh. ever be your primary goal. Unless it's just for fun, then play orcs. Yeah, yeah. Or if like um you can you can you can build a list that is a path to victory of killing. Uh, but you have to, in most cases, be able to accomplish that in two turns or less. Right. Uh, because it's a five turn game. So that's another part of knowing path to victory. Uh, all Age of Sigmar battle plans for the tournament scene currently are five rounds. Um, so if you control the majority of objective points for three rounds, in almost all circumstances, you're going to win. There's a couple where uh, they're worth exponentially more points. Right. Um, and that's also part of it. Uh, if you're designing a list for a tournament, in theory, you've been given a packet for that tournament. And a lot of times that packet will tell you what battle plans you're playing on. Um, so even if you have a base list and this is your army, you play... Uh, Shadow Strike, Fangs of Sotek, uh, whatever your army is, and you see that um, it's total commitment, maybe now you want to change something. Or you play Dracothian Tell, uh, and you see it's total commitment. Well, maybe now you don't want to play Dracothian's Tell. Maybe for this tournament you want to play something else. That type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of being able to control objectives to score more victory points, um, I find that in list building, there's a couple of... Um, archetypes that tend to stand out uh you have alpha strike armies which are th they can kind of be two different types there's the i want to kill enough of you in those one to two turn limit uh to win by killing or there's i want to remove um whatever key component whatever key synergy whatever hammer you've built uh and gain advantage that way so right. those are sort of the I alpha strike heroes i want to cripple you i want to take out your legs yeah, yeah, it's a more surgical alpha strike versus just, uh, I plan to table you. It's something our army does very, very well. Yes. Uh, and then after that is board control. Mm -hmm. um, this is the type of army that I used to really lean into, and I still like a lot. Right, it's um, what we used to be masters of, and now we're mm -hmm. okay at. Yeah, we've got enough cheap bodies that are actually good enough on the table that we can still do a lot of zoning type board control. Um, but board control armies are generally focused not necessarily on killing enemy units to stop them from scoring, but just not giving them a place to score. Um, not letting them move, not letting them get on the objective points if they do move. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it's why uh, you get those rings of units around objectives that are just at the edge of it. Yeah. Uh, and then there's anvil armies. So those are armies uh, that are really hard to beat on battle plans like duality of death where there's only two objectives mm -hmm. and if you get there first it's yours until you kill that unit this um, would be what's so, so good about mortar guard fire mm -hmm. slayers and a few others mm -hmm. uh and I, I distinguish between anvil and attrition they're conceptually very simil similar similar mm -hmm. um but anvil is really about not breaking Whereas I find attrition to be about slow incremental gains. Right. Um, 
we can't do anvil play we can do attrition play yes yeah um our anvil unit for lack of better words uh Saris guard is not a good anvil um no no neither guard nor bastilladon do that job particularly well yep guard because everyone else in the army does it better bastilladon because there's not enough of him yeah yeah uh, and then on the the opposite end of Anvil are uh, winning by being a really good hammer. Um, so this plague is where monks and Skaven mm-hmm. fall very heavily. Yeah, and daughters of Cain. They're also very much a hammer. Um, mm-hmm. They've got some attrition to them. They're somewhere between attrition and hammer, or uh, yeah, attrition and hammer. Yep, but because uh, they can also be very durable. Hagnar's five five after save will keep them around for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, counter attack armies. Um, these are sort of like light hammer armies or armies that almost always manifest as a counter meta army. Like there's, uh, in the Ideneth meta, um, like this time last year, mm-hmm. uh, there, you saw a lot of counter attack type armies where yeah. you're like, I want to soak up your attack. And then I plan to turn on you and kill you off and gain advantage from there. Yep. It's um, often called beta strike for those who hear yes. it elsewhere. And I think this is where our army does the best. Mm-hmm. Because we can do decent enough damage, but we have enough bodies to live through the first wave. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of our units aren't terribly durable, but fast enough to capitalize on any mistakes made. Mm-hmm. Uh, counterattack, I also find, works really well when you're not certain you're going to be able to control... Uh, the first turn order, where you're a high drop army. Um, Another thing that we just can't do, so it works yeah. out. Yeah. Um, so, and that that's why it's important to list building. Like, there are certain things that if you're going to be one of those types of armies, you need to accomplish. Like, if you're building around an Alpha Strike army, you want to be able to dictate first turn. It doesn't mean you're going to take it. You just want to be able to, if a huge opportunity presents itself, and you're capable of playing on it, you want to have the choice to play on it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, board control... Oh, go ahead. Also, low drops doesn't mean you're going first. They can give it to you. So prepare it just in case. Yeah, um, and, and understanding... Uh, if you're building a high drop army, you need to build an army that can accomplish something if you're made to go first, and can be okay if you don't get to go first. Mm -hmm. Uh, For Seraphon specifically, that's something we have to do now. Uh, Even if you're building some alpha strikey stuff, like you're taking Pterodons, uh, you're taking uh, Stink, Salamanders, salamanders, yeah, whatever you're wanting to do. Uh, Even Endless Spell um, type stuff. Uh, You need to be able to have gameplay going either first or second. Mm -hmm. And expect to not be in control of making that decision. Right. Um, There's like two armies we can be in the running on yeah uh and and understanding a large part of list building is understanding list playing um which i'll I'll get a bit more into uh towards the end of it um but there's always conditions that if you think about what is my path to victory am i getting there through alpha strikes am i getting there through board control anvil hammer hammers counterattacks attrition mixtures of those thereof because a list is rarely purest Mm. um understanding what that path to victory is as you're building the list so that you don't end up with things that are contradictory to each other like if you're trying to build um an army that focuses on board control but you've taken a bunch of like glass hammers that might be difficult um yeah not the best thing although our glass hammers are very good at board control yeah, we're we're a bit lucky in that respect. We're not as versatile as we once were, but we're still highly versatile mm-hmm. um, in terms of list building. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing that you always have to take into account when you're building a list uh, is your resource management. Um, this can be things like Celestial Conjuration, uh, Command Points, uh, Fate Dice, whatever your army resources are. Or just um, how many spells you can cast in Unbind. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're building an endless spell army, um, yeah, then, then now you should probably have the accurate so wizards. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and if you're taking like seven endless spells and you only have two wizards in your army, uh, you can only cast 
to a turn so you're not going to even get the chance to cast all of them until turn three like that type of thing that that right. understanding of resource management um and understanding your army's command point upkeep um so if you're taking for instance fangs of sotek is a great example of this if you're taking a bunch of skinks and your plan is well, i'm going to run my skinks up i'm going to put my serpent staff on them i'm going to shoot you and then when you charge me i'm going to use my fangs of sotek command ability um we well, have to know how many command points you're going to continually be generating and whether or not you can expect to use it on all the units you need to. Right. Do um, I have enough if you've... output to support as many units as I have on the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do I have an, enough um, people or units to provide that output? Mm -hmm. um, like if you have four blobs of skinks and two skink heroes, um, chances are, unless your table position ends up a bit weird, you're only going to get to use two of them um so that type of thing uh understanding the upkeep making sure you have all your auras just making sure that in general you're generating the resources you need um and, being and that's where them where you need yes and that's where i find battalions uh become really important in list building a lot of my two battalion or not battalion decisions are not always looking at the direct battalion benefits it's looking at the extra command point um the extra artifact like Aether tools that i very important mm -hmm. yep all those other tools i want to give the army um and i, I do find uh that I, I if i have an extra artifact slot with seraphon it's almost always going to be aether courts um i still really like all the realm of shadow artifacts for the most part they are a lot um, of fun and they have like if you long history for us yeah yeah especially if you're going like true alpha strike if you're like i just want to hit you as hard as i can and hope you don't get back up uh ugu might be a better um choice than than hish um if not which is thematically appropriate that's true yeah <laughs> uh so I, I feel like that's super important to uh consider in list building like um understanding whether or not you want to smooth out a weakness or better hone a strength. Mm -hmm. um, it's why Croak is so important, because he generates so many command points. Even if he didn't do anything else, he'd be really important to take in our lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fact that he does those other things is just so much value. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that people complain about just how good our heroes are, like, and just how cheap they are. Until And this is true in a vacuum, but... Mm -hmm. The fact that our armies live and die on having our heroes and mm -hmm. having them where they need to be and having a lot of them means it kind of balances out. Yeah, not to get too much onto the topic of um, balancing, um, but I find that GW does a better job balancing an army than they do a unit. Um, like Fire Slayer, Hearthguard Berserkers are incredibly under costed for what they do mm -hmm. but all the other things you have to bring to really make them good like it's still a good army they're very much a top tier army very much so. um but it's not like their whole army's under costed one thing in their army's under costed and, and that tends to normally be sort of even out across the game right it's when everything is under costed or everything is way too good that or way too bad that things become a problem yeah yeah it's okay to be good guys. Other yeah. armies can have good things. We can too. Yeah. Um, and, and so one of the things that I keep in mind with uh, how many resources is my army going to need uh, for building a list is understanding. It, you, you really want to study the battle plans. Like if you're trying to hone and perfect a list, you want to understand how many turns do I think I'm going to have to do X with this unit. Mm -hmm. um so knowing well sure i have five units of skinks and so i probably want to have three to five command points of turns so that i can do the things i need to do with them understanding that you don't actually need to do that you just need to do that for the first turn or two mm -hmm. is important because those units of skinks aren't going to be there all game um, and neither are their targets yeah and, and neither are their targets um so it's always in my opinion safer to front load your cost than to worry about um, running out in the late game. 
Like, if you do things right in the early game, you should be able to win late game almost always. Um, at least that's been my experience. Uh, and, and there's true. always games where it's uphill battles, and, like, you know if you're going to win this game, it's going to be turn five. Uh, and those are generally much more than, in like, getting incremental gains against your opponent. It's like you have to deplete them quick and whatever. Um, so yeah, even in those situations, I find front loading much more important. Mm. Um, that used to be how we had to play all the time was win in yeah. turn three and four. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, man, I, I really miss it. The old one drop, uh, things of Sotek with shadow strike that I used to play. I frankly was winning turn one with that. My opponents just hadn't done the math to know it. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that was the goal. Like, okay, I'm going to trap you in your deployment. And this is how long I'm going to, this is how I'm going to stagger. And this is like all that stuff. Uh, th there were definitely games where like you were winning turn one and then confirming it all the way out to turn five. Mm. Um, A couple times I had people concede when I managed to pin them with this skin cord. Because mm -hmm. yep. they knew they just couldn't get out of it. Yeah, yeah. Or at least not quick enough. Uh, and then the next most important thing, so we'll, so far it's um, knowing your paths to victory, understanding your game resources. After that, it's knowing what to expect from the units you're selecting. Um, and this involves a couple different things, but essentially what it boils down to is when you choose a unit, you have a job in mind for it that you've chosen for it to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know what it accomplishing it will look like, like what you have to do to make it happen. Right. Um, you're not just taking it because it's generally good. Yep. You're taking it because this, yeah, this is a role in your army that needs filling, and this is what this unit does very well. Yeah. It's usually where uh, units fail on the war scroll. Uh-huh. They either um, don't like, have a job or something else does it way, way better. That's true. Uh, I think Croxagar and Salamander for our army are a really good example of this. Um, Croxagar point for outcome. Like if, if you put, uh, if you get two units, 280 points mm -hmm. uh, versus the 240 points of a Salamander, and then you like even out their points, like you do the math on it. it yeah. Anyways, you average and even out their points. They're almost identical in outcome. Um, right. At, at what you're wanting them to do. Uh, the difference is, do you need to snipe that Galthazar harvester or do you need to kill the Mortec guard that are left in its footprint? Right. Um, or do you so, need to discourage a charge? Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever else you have in mind with it. Um, so that's something that I see a lot of novice list struggle with is they're like, Oh, salamanders are really good. I'm just going to spam salamanders. Um, and but, that's not the worst thing you can do, but there are better ways of playing things. Yeah, yeah, you're much better off if you're like, all right, I'm going to take two units of salamanders because this is the amount of damage I expect to get out of them, and this is how I plan to use that damage. Mm -hmm. um, that is super important to making that decision between, well, do I want Croxigar or do I want salamanders? Hmm. And uh, do I want to take them at all? Yeah, yeah. Do I even need either of them? Do I have enough of it? Do I need some other job to happen in my army? Mm -hmm. uh, which really comes around to building balanced and tuned lists. Um, or jankily unbalanced lists that work just right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Math Hammer is super important. Like understanding a bit of the number side. Mm -hmm. um, and this you can do like, you, you can hard math it out. Like like what definitely I do. doable mm -hmm. super useful to have um but in my experience you also kind of get to a point where you can gut it out like you know oh i have salamanders they have whatever i know my salamanders are going to fare better in this combat mm -hmm. um well the goal of math hammer is not just to always have numbers in your head it's to give you a general feel that you can build from there yep yeah it's a data point um, not the end goal yeah, for sure. I just don't want people to feel like, oh, well, I don't, I'm bad at algebra, so I can't play competitive. Uh, no, it's not that. Hammer. That's definitely not the case. Um, because... Math hammer is just sort of, yeah, that colloquial tool. Right. Even for people who are very good at it, like me, I can't just take exact numbers to the game. And even if I can, this is a dice game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in Math Hammer's, uh, I find sort of the statistics side of it uh, personally more useful than um, like the algebraic I can expect 0.12 damage per 10 points I spend. Like that side doesn't help me as much. Mm -hmm. um, I find much more use from the I've got a 70% chance of this succeeding or failing. Um, that type of risk assessment I find much more personally useful. And that's sort of what I tend towards in list building. Like if I need five command points turn one, what do I need to do to have an 80% chance of having those five command points turn one? That type of thing. Hmm. Two slan and a skink priest star. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and maybe a battalion, stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. uh, that's where the math hammer is important. Like, understanding what your goals are, what benchmarks you're trying to hit, uh, and then doing the math in your list to figure out if you're going to reach those benchmarks or not, and then how likely those benchmarks are for you to hit. Right. Because building for tournaments is building a strategy that you want to play out right. Yeah, you you. it's part of um, building with a goal in mind. Like, your list should have a purpose. Um, beyond just I'm going to play my unit and hope I play it efficiently and I hope it works out better than it did for my opponent. Mm -hmm. um, like that's what a lot of gameplay ends up being. Um, but the list building phase is where you can take the actions to give you the most advantage prior to that happening as possible. Right. And it's rare, but you can lose in the list building phase. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, like I've played against... Um, a number of armies where like once my opponent handed me the list like i i knew i was going to win or once they handed me the list i was like oh this is almost impossible for me to beat right um you'll need like you'll need the luck of the gods yep yep and that's important to know like you need to be able to look at your list and an opponent's list and understand that because you want to make good decisions and if you're playing safe and you need lightning to strike in order to win then you're playing wrong. Like you can't win at that point. You're just not giving yourself the opportunity or right. vice versa. If you're like, wow, my opponent like needs a divine intervention to win this game. Uh, then, you know, you should play pretty safe. Like don't give them the chance for that random double turn where they get all those sixes to hit that explode. And like, just don't give it to them. Mm -hmm. Don't let them in the game. Um, yep. Uh, shoot. Uh, and then, uh, further past like knowing what to expect from your unit and how the math hammer plays into it you need to always be keeping in mind that the game is five turns so how many turns are you looking for whatever unit you've chosen mm -hmm. to be able to do the job you've chosen for it um so if you've got a shooting list and you're taking shooting skinks and you're wanting to do x damage over the course of two turns because that's how much damage it's going to take for you to kill a unit of 20 arc hearthguard berserkers or whatever else um you need to to presumably do that in two turns or less because you're trying to be on the objective for an extra turn over your opponent um so keeping that five turn limit in mind and understanding like oh yeah i can do that with just shooting so i'm going to take shields because i don't want to lose any of my guys to throwing axes um right. that's important for decision making or doing the math and being like, oh, it's going to take me three turns to do it. So I actually have to take clubs. Um, knowing the job and the amount of time that you have to do that job in mm -hmm. uh, is plays a huge factor into the loadout of a unit and how much of a unit you want to take. Um, what support you're going to have to give for it, how much resources like command points are you, you're going to have to devote to accomplishing that. Right. Um, and AOS is a complicated enough game that there is no definitive answer to these questions. Yeah. Um, generally, all these questions that I'm doing are 100% centered around whatever the current meta for the tournament scene is. Mm -hmm. um, and this will take practice. This will take a long work time working on just understanding how the game runs. Yeah. Uh, the quickest shortcut to meta uh, is actually, you can look at several uh, resources. There's the AOS Reminders app that aggregates a lot of data and tells you what's being played. Mm -hmm. um, so that's useful. 
Uh, and then you can actually go on to the ITC rankings, at least for the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see what player and what army and what list they brought to an event uh, right. and how they placed in that event. Um, so that's the quickest way to get an idea of meta. Uh, like last uh, start of February, if you wanted to know what the meta was, you looked at LVO. Mm -hmm. um, and then you knew the meta. Ta-da! Um, so uh, uh, being able to look at a list and understand, okay, this is the goal of my opponent. How do I build a list that lets me stop that or mm -hmm. ignore it? One or the other. And there are a lot of good good resources to this. The Honest Wargamer has good stats for this. So does mm -hmm. uh, AOS Coach. He does about a monthly thing, just seeing what everyone is using. So yeah, yeah. A bunch of great things for new players who are trying to learn what they need to account for. Yeah. Uh, wide World of Wargaming. Uh, the two main guys that run that podcast, uh, Jeremy Vasiras and Alex Gonzalez, uh, they go to a ton of tournaments mm -hmm. uh, and they win them. They're normally, one of them's normally first and the other's also in the top three for, and they go together. Um, so they're also a great resource for like picking up meta knowledge if you don't have any meta knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's tons of resources out there. Um, and I find that uh, I benefit more if I'm like, if I want an insight into something. I generally try to find a tournament player who plays against the meta versus just someone who's analyzing it. Right. Um, because yeah, so, plans tend to fall apart when they come into combat. Yeah, yeah. And theory crafting can be sort of a heady exercise. Uh, so. And you might be forgetting a crucial thing that becomes apparent the second you play against someone who knows how to stop it or counterplay it or whatever. It's, it's um, why I've stopped doing a lot of, like crafting and arguments on Lustria at the moment, we just don't have any data points to work off of. Mm. It's still fun to talk about, but it, it's really hard to give a definitive answer at the moment. We just don't know. Yeah, because there haven't been tournaments. There haven't been tournaments. There haven't even been games for most people. Uh, and also, one thing that I at Metaplay, uh, I do find that the mid-rank tournament players fall into a trap where they think the meta is set in stone, and if you're not playing X unit, you're not winning with X army. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case. Like, if you want to beat the guy that's on top, you have to do something they haven't seen before normally. Mm -hmm. um, so you you might be the guy who changes meta. You might be the guy who sets meta. Uh, but that still requires an understanding of meta. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that like you have to agree with it. You just have to know what people plan to play and how they plan to play it. Right. And the basis of all meta is knowing your army first and foremost. You need to know mm -hmm. it very well. And knowing what other armies can do. A lot of casual games fall into, I lost because I had no idea what your army is. Mm-hmm. That's actually how Seraphon used to win tournaments, too. <laughs> no one knew what we yeah. did. I've been to um, GTs, uh, where I won games against people who play often, uh, like big, proper, like LVO-type tournaments, and they're like, remind me what Seraphon does. <laughs> it's yeah. always wise at the beginning to ask questions of your opponent. Mm, yeah. If, if you don't have information about something your opponent's army does, mm -hmm. uh, that's your fault. It also Assume does... it's your fault, and you have to ask them. Mm -hmm. Yep. It also does a great job of understanding why they brought what they did. Mm -hmm. Because while you're list building, they're list building too. And if you can Correct. figure out their mindset behind it, you can understand why their units are there and how to stop them. Yeah, and I it's something you should do anyways because I find um, most people want to talk about the thing they did. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a good way to start off a friendly relationship at the start of a game, especially with right. a stranger. Um, it's and, a hobby game. We love talking yeah, exactly. about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I mean, especially at tournaments. The one I've ever been to was just so much fun and everyone just is enjoying being there for 
playing games. Not everyone is trying to crush you. Yeah, uh, aside from the rest of the conversation, uh, Sigmar is really fortunate with its community. Mm -hmm. Um, Even, like, the top-tier play. Uh, This is the first uh, miniature wargaming that I've really gotten into as a tournament. Uh, I did some X-Wing stuff back in the day that I, I actually did shockingly well with I, I wasn't trying to try hard i just got lucky mm-hmm. and chose the right things um but this is the first game that i've really put in a lot of effort to uh trying to improve and do well in tournaments and increase my uh rankings um it has a really good community not just its uh, secondary community for content production mm-hmm. uh but its player community like if a list is too good a lot of times you see even the top players will avoid playing it. Like, it's just not fun, so they're not interested. Right. Um, we, we saw this a lot with Skaven back when they were yeah. King of the Hill. People would avoid bringing Plague Monks. They would avoid bringing Je- uh, Jesuits. Because... Yeah, just it wasn't fun to play. Right, because this isn't so much a game as it is a, pa- uh, a community experience. Mm-hmm. And if your opponent's not having any fun, unless you're that guy, then you aren't often having any fun. Yeah. Uh, which is also something I've really, <laughs> further asides, it's something I try to keep in mind as an opponent. Like, am I being a sour loser? And am I robbing the fun out of this person's victory? Um, and it's something I've definitely grown more conscious of because in my local area, I have a pretty good rep for being really difficult to beat in a game. Mm. Um so if I'm ever on the back foot, I want to make sure that I'm not dealing their moment of, oh my God, I'm winning this game. I didn't think I was going to win from them. Um, yeah, I'm going to be and, perfectly and vice versa. bad at that. Mm. It, it's not something I started out aware of, um, but because uh, I ended up in a lot of community groups locally for the hobby, uh, it's something I've become more aware of. And I try to be aware of when I'm playing games. Um, I tend to get very solemn and contemplative in the Mm. games when I'm playing them. Uh, And so it's something I've tried to break the habit of, uh, which I have found another side. Bourbon is a great way to do that. Uh, (laughs) If you're playing at an event and alcohol is allowed, uh, I normally have like at least a shot around with my opponent if they're interested. Uh, Yeah, it's just a very much beer and pretzels community. Yeah, yeah. Even like uh, the... I, I went to an event uh, called the uh, Hammer. Yeah, the Hammer, not the Forge, uh, which is a small local tournament up in Spokane. It's a GT. It normally gets somewhere between like 15 and 25 people. Mm-hmm. But what's crazy is that it ends up normally with about six people from the top 10 of LVO. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So even though it's a small tournament, it feels a little bit more like an invitational than an open. Yeah, like um, the Masters. Yeah, but at the same time, even though it's a small tournament and there's those really good guys, there's also people that are like, I just want to play dwarves, and here's my dwarves. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I was at that event, I was playing against um, one of the like super top-ranked players, uh, and we were like smashed. Like the, the concern was definitely more on having fun than being like, oh, well, I probably shouldn't drink because I want to win this game. Right, and that's... Um, much more a thing in tournaments than a lot of people realize. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and I, I think it is important to the general concept of even list building. Like, your goal uh, should still be to have fun in yeah. understanding, like, don't be afraid. It's okay to try something out, even in a tournament, the first time you take it there, uh, and not know if it's going to work because it's okay. Have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have like there's a level of intimidation about this game that is a little bit unwarranted. Um, right. Well, I like, think it's just tournaments it. in general. It's a big scary word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But not all tables are top tables, and even those, they're having a lot more fun than chess matches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have heard some of the like some of the one-liners that stick with me the most, which are not YouTube appropriate. Uh, were all things that I heard someone yell or shout at a tournament. Um, yeah, uh, they're they're super fun. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, even if your goal is only to manage to break the three and two threshold. 
Yeah, and going three out of five is honestly like especially for early tournaments mm -hmm. is super impressive for multi-day tournaments like just anytime you're doing more wins than you're doing losses in a game uh in a tournament uh that's great that's you're on average or better than average because most events are a five game event mm -hmm. um so yeah like that that's a great goal to have um it's usually what i shoot for then again i've been playing seraphon for a while <laughs> mm. It's, huh. I'm happy if I go three and two, like genuinely happy. Um, I've been lucky in my lineups that I've never done worse than that. I normally like four and one. Mm. Um, and, and a lot of times that's, that's sort of a lineup type issue. Um, like well, I only have to play one of the top two players and not both. When I have to play both, then normally I'm, I'm three and two. Yeah, that's one of the good things about GW tournaments. The way they build it means you're more often than not playing people your skill level. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, build, building your list, understanding how you're going to win with the list, understanding the components that allow you to score and stop your opponent from scoring. Fundamentally, your job in making a list is building a list that can pose questions to your opponent that they have a difficult time answering mm -hmm. and then preempting the questions your opponent plans to ask you with their list and having an answer built in. Um, right. It's if you can do those two things, you'll, you'll normally win. It's the general three threat rule that the Europeans are playing with at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yep. You want to have three things in your army that the opponent has to deal with in order for them to win. Yeah. Yeah doesn't necessarily need to be something dangerous it just needs to be something that needs dealing with yeah if, if they ignore it it will cost them the game mm -hmm. um yep uh, uh yeah. so those are the those are the things i focus on when i'm trying to build a list those are the questions i'm asking myself along the way um and eventually i find that i get to a point uh where i'll get in a bit of a rut i'm like okay my question is how do i kill Galthazar Harvester. All right, well, I already figured this out earlier. You kill Galthazar Harvesters with two units of Salamanders. Um, and sometimes taking a step back and being like, yeah, but I don't want to buy two units of Salamanders. <laughs> what if I bring this instead? Um, so make sure that if you're building lots of lists and you're trying to optimize and improve, uh, reevaluate from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, like each time you do it, I find that to be super useful. Right. Um, it's really easy to get stuck in your own head. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, well, I need to kill 30 more tech guard, so I bring Sunclaw Star Host with this source, and this is how I'm going to buff him, then I'll kill him. Like, mm -hmm. uh, instead saying, okay, well, what if I instead brought 24 Pterodons? Would that work? Um, yeah, finding... Yeah, very uh, much right. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you bring up a good point. <laughs> You often you do have to account in your list building for the top dogs in the meta at the moment. Yeah, there's always gatekeepers. Um, so if your list can't answer gatekeepers, uh, and what I mean by gatekeeper, if it's not obvious, is there are some armies in the game that are popular and they're good. Um, so good. chances are you're going to play against them. And if you don't know how to beat them, you're not going 5-0. Right. Um, or even four and one. Or four and one, yeah. And possibly three and two. Uh, it really just depends. Yep. Um, but if your goal is to win a tournament, uh, then the list you're building to do that has to have an answer to gatekeepers. Um, and OBR are one of the gatekeepers at the moment. OBR, um, Zinch, uh, Cities. Not so much Firekeepers because they aren't as popular. Yeah, it's because they're OBR, but not quite as good and a little bit different. Like, they're quicker OBR uh, if you get their prayers off. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they're pretty much OBR in diapers. <laughs> and that is why it's not as common. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I could play cool, evil-looking skeleton men. Or that dude with a mohawk and no clothes. <laughs> oh. Uh, they, need, uh, they need new models. Yeah, they really do. Which is sad, because they are a new army, all things considered. Well, yeah. 
I, I think it was just a bad decision right at the beginning. They said, <laughs> let's make let's take one model and make it into six separate units. Yeah, but all we're really going to do is change the pose and how big the mohawk is. Right. And they have yeah. some really cool stuff. Magma Dross are really cool. They are, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, we're going to have to have an episode about aesthetics and what draws somebody people to an army. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that that's pretty much what I had planned to discuss, cover for... Uh, list building for the goals that I'm trying to accomplish whenever I choose units. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, just remember that we play to objectives and each unit is there for a reason, not just because it's good. Yep. Yeah, and, and just taking something because it's good can be a reason. Like, if you need a flexible post, like, mm -hmm. eh, well, I've got objective control covered, I've got some board control covered, um, I don't really know what to bring, and I have this number of points left over. Bringing a really point-efficient unit a lot of times can be the answer. Um, but I find that I tend to not enjoy or play as well if I've built an army that's just about point efficiency. Right. Um, because as much as that's a way to win, this is also a game to have fun. Yeah, and I find that against like the the best players, that's not normally going to win you the game, anyways. Right. Um, yeah, and a lot of those lists, those like just point efficient ones, a lot of those are the gatekeepers. Um, mm, and yeah. Zinch is crazy good. They did they won a lot of tournaments, but they didn't win all of them, and they didn't win all of them because that's what they're about. They're about maximizing overall efficiency and so if someone's playing a list that's got a good toolkit in it mm -hmm. uh and they can answer those questions well all of a sudden that efficiency doesn't matter anymore because you don't have tools you just have whatever efficiency you're spamming right hmm. yeah and i think that people uh another thing that early people fall into is list uh net listing Mm. The not understanding why it's good, but just that it's That's good. very true. And mm -hmm. relying too heavily on what you brought instead of how you play. Mm -hmm. uh, I do find uh, netlisting is a great way to learn the game, though. Like, right. Even if you're just wanting to use it as a uh, mental exercise, mm -hmm. um, look at netlist. Uh, read through all the war scrolls they have on them, like go on Games Workshop's web store if you have to and read all the war scrolls and piece together what the goal of that list is that you just looked up that someone posted on the internet because they won a tournament with it. Right. Um, Do this that's a good way to learn the game. Either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, an army you don't play, for armies you do play, like figuring that out, getting into that mindset, that will teach you a lot about the game if you can break it apart and figure out what they're building. Um, reverse engineering is a valid tactic to learn how to build a list. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Is there anything else you want to address today? Nah, that's everything I had in mind. Well then, I'm sorry all if this got a bit headier than we normally do. It's a big topic that's fairly complicated. Uh, and I think next week, I, I don't know if we want to keep doing this series, but if we were going to keep going on this thing, um, I think it could be fun to get into some specific list. Like, how does this translate to a specific list? Um, if you have a question that you want to ask us, like, how do I build a list that accomplishes any of the things we've talked about or something entirely different? Um, mm -hmm. Or just questions. Please leave us those questions, yeah. Yep. In the comments, on Discord, on Lustria, we're willing to answer what you can do, either here or in person. But as for that, the jungle's calling me home. Thank you, Lizard Wizard, for talking with me today. Yeah, thank you. Sorry I uh, hogged the mic. Nah, you're fine. That's why you're here. <laughs> but you all have a wonderful night. Good night.